Welcome to Heterodox Out Loud, a podcast that brings you the most compelling and provocative essays from the Heterodox Academy blog. I'm Zach Rausch, and today, viewpoint diversity in K through 12 education. Today's episode is about the importance of diversity of thought, unorthodox thought, even rebellious thought in the K-12 classroom. Although our blog today looks at the lack of political diversity in schools, it also speaks to a broader question. What do we do with children who don't tow traditional lines, who don't follow along? The blog Why K-12 Needs Viewpoint Diversity Now was written by Will Roosh. He's a high school history teacher and the co-moderator of the Heterodox K-12 community. You can learn more about our 20-plus Heterodox communities on our website. Will is here on the show. In a country like America, where we're incredibly diverse, if we only focus on how we're different, we're going to pull apart. And we need to focus on where we're similar because we are so different in so many ways that I think that it's very valuable to look at what we have in common rather than focusing so much on where we differ. Will Roosh. We'll have an in-depth conversation later in this episode, but first, his blog, Why K-12 Needs Viewpoint Diversity Now, narrated by Richard Davies. In the fall of 2016, before the presidential election, a ninth grader came to school wearing a Trump 2016 t-shirt. I walked into the faculty lounge that morning to get a cup of coffee, and nearly a dozen teachers were standing in front of the one-way glass window, looking at him with open disgust. They were discussing how the student should best be reprimanded, or at least re-educated, for his politically indefensible display. Their comments included, Why is he wearing that? Is he racist? This is not okay. This is not normal. I interjected, why don't you ask him? My question was immediately met with head shaking and looks that told me that I clearly didn't understand. To my colleagues, the shirt was so gross an offense that engagement served no purpose. To me, their unwillingness to talk with him was a missed opportunity to better understand the perspective of someone who saw things differently. The tenor of the discussion around politics that I saw play out that morning, both the judgments and the refusal to engage, reveals a persistent problem in our schools. It's a problem that extends far beyond the comments of a few teachers in the faculty lounge. I have been a teacher for 14 years. For the past seven years, I have been at a private high school in Los Angeles. For seven years before that, I was a public high school teacher in Los Angeles and in Philadelphia. What I've seen alarms me. The lack of humility on the part of educators when it comes to teaching students about cultural, religious, political, viewpoint, and ideological diversity has resulted in a climate that stifles learning. While all of these components are important in recent years, the need for an understanding of political diversity has become the most salient. I have seen a pervasive norm that conservative ideas are bad and progressive ideas are good. While this norm may be reversed in other districts around the country, the reality is that most colleges of education, the institutions that train and produce teachers, are situated at universities that support this orthodoxy. In my current position, I run my U.S. history, gov, econ, and civics classes in a way that welcomes all political perspectives. Because of that, I have become one of the few instructors at the school students feel they can come up to when their perspectives don't perfectly align with what they feel is the right view. Students have come to me reporting things like, if I bash Trump in my essay, I get an A, and if I promote building the wall— I fail. While I believe that this is, to some extent, hyperbolic, perception matters, and it indicates a broader problem in primary and secondary school education. There are at least three reasons that this needs our attention. 
First, one of the goals of education should be to prepare students for the rights and responsibilities of citizenship, fostering the ability to think about complex and controversial issues from a variety of perspectives with an eye towards problem-solving is a necessary part of that process. Second, higher education has, up to this point, received the lion's share of attention on the problem of ideological conformity. But prioritizing reform only at the level of post-secondary education ignores a significant fraction of young people. The National Center for Educational Statistics showed that in 2017, about 44% of high school completers enrolled in four-year institutions and 23% enrolled in two-year institutions, excluding about one-third of high school completers from any resulting advances. Third, modeling respectful discourse has to start early if it is to become internalized. K-12 students need to observe their instructors articulating and defending various positions and exhibiting genuine and thoughtful curiosity about views different from their own. Moreover, students should see that the ability to reason through an argument and the demonstration of curiosity are desirable and valuable traits to have. We should be training students to be critical thinkers, where critical thinking is the analysis and evaluation of an issue free of ideological and subjective judgments. This skill is rarely taught in secondary school classrooms, even though schools know how to do this, at least in principle. In fact, this approach is more frequently seen in early childhood and elementary classrooms. It's present in activities like, how many uses can you think of for a paperclip? This type of thought exercise lays the groundwork for problem-solving and thinking outside of the box. However, at some point, usually during middle school, when the topics become decidedly more controversial than paper clips, structured lessons with a specific political agenda and singular viewpoint become the norm. A few months after that morning in the faculty lounge, I had the opportunity to speak with the student who had worn the Trump t-shirt. He explained that he wore it partly out of pride for his conservative ideals and partly out of frustration for the way he felt those ideals were judged in the school setting. Based on the teacher's comments I've overheard, he was right to feel that way. This problem of a singular ideological position in primary and secondary education is likely to intensify, at the very least in the near term. For instance, students have demanded that anti-racism readings be adopted in classrooms across the country. While there are certainly merits to the anti-racist perspective, by incorporating it as a teaching tool, we're reflexively and uncritically accepting this version of the world. But this is not what education should be. After all, we shouldn't be telling young minds what to think. We should be teaching them how to think. That was from the blog, Why K-12 Needs Viewpoint Diversity Now, narrated by Richard Davies. Will Roosh is with us now. Tell us your story and why you became interested in K-12 education. So I, I'm just a school teacher. I mean, I've been, been in Los Angeles for 15 years. I taught public school for seven years out here. And then I've been at a private school for eight years. I taught charter. I taught all over, just like high school. Um, and in about 2015, uh, I was just made aware of these like events on college campuses. It was Brett Weinstein, Jordan Peterson, and Nick Christakis. Uh, and there was like this, you know, this weird kind of, push from those events that was kind of under this social justice label that I was always just like assumed was, was all good. And then it made me see like another side of that that was like, oh, wait a second, this thing that's just viewed as all good top to bottom might not be so. And that just started me on this crazy tumbling down the rabbit hole of what viewpoint diversity all kind of is. And, um, and I said, you know, this is happening on college campuses, but I'm seeing this on K through 12, especially in, in high school, things like that, just like among teachers. So I read um, John Haidt's book, Righteous Mind, and then Calling an American Mind. And I was like, wow, this is, you know, Heterodox Academy seems like something really important. 
and I couldn't get in because it's, I don't have a terminal degree and it was just for college professors and things like that. But I, you know, promote to my students and I try to live it, just be a squeaky wheel. And it's really cool to see K through 12 kind of being included in that now because it's been, you know, a couple of years that I've been pushing for it. Can you talk a little bit more about why viewpoint diversity is important in K-12 education? Yeah. So I teach high school and I've always taught high school. So when a ninth grader walks into high school, they're essentially a child. You leave as a senior graduate, like you are a, by society standards, an adult. So that process of going from child to adult happens in these four crucial years. By the time they get to university, which was kind of the focus of Heterodox Academy, like the students have already been led down a pathway for several years. So the earlier we can start this process of understanding different viewpoints and different perspectives and things like that, the better, because that's really where I think like, you know, understanding the world comes from. It's kind of lost. It's been lost in a lot of schools around the country. So do you think there should be any distinction in the way that you know, we think and teach about viewpoint diversity in college to how you talk about these things in high school. In high school, the students are very focused on themselves because they're trying to figure out who they are and what is the world and what is their place in the world and all that kind of stuff. So making it very personal. A lot of the, the stuff I do surrounding, you know, concepts like viewpoint diversity is all about you in your life. The first assignment I give my 10th grade U.S. history class is I have them recall a uh, significant life story of theirs. And then I have them tell that same story from three different perspectives. Like a kid might say, like, when I won the hockey game and I hit the winning goal in a hockey game, then they would say, okay, well, what about from the viewpoint from the goalie? What was it like? For what about the goalie's mom? You know, and it just gets them to think like, oh, the telling that I have of, of the world is different depending on who's telling it. And then that transitions really well into my U.S. history class. And then when I get up to my senior level classes, like a civics class, I teach government economics, I can just bring in more of those kinds of like the ideas of why people make the decisions that they do in government and things like that. And I try to always make it more personal. I think that might be a big difference for high school compared to college. So along the lines of this, what advice would you give to other K-12 teachers who are looking to bring in more viewpoint diversity? What would be some advice that you have? This sounds cliche, but it's harder to do in practice, but like seek disconfirmation. Students are watching you. And if you have a very clear cut ideological line along political lines or something like that, the students pick up on that and they can manipulate that in a whole host of ways. So I think the advice that I would give is to challenge yourself about what do you know to be true when it comes to maybe political viewpoints, religious viewpoints, whatever it is, and then challenge that and show your students what, how you challenge that. So that they can see that, that learning is this really disruptive, turbulent process to try and arrive at the best ideas. And the students like it. They like, like you being unsure, you being in front of the class, sharing your process with them. I swear I thought that this was the right thing. And then I went down this deep dive one night or over the course of a couple of weeks and a couple of books, and I was missing some big things. I had some blind spots because then if you're wrong and you're saying it's okay to have bad ideas and then correct them and update your concept of these scenarios or whatever it might be, then they have permission. And then at a more like uh, specific level, what advice would you give to K-12 teachers who do want to teach about things like racism, sexism, class differences, and how do you do that in a way that is not alienating students? It's tough. I mean, I think it's hard. I think that's why there's so many people doing it poorly. Is There isn't like one way to do it. In a country like America, where we're incredibly diverse, if we only focus on how we're different, we're going to pull apart. And we need to focus on where we're similar because we are so different in so many ways that I think that it's very valuable to look at what we have in common rather than focusing so much on where we differ. What is it that you want to make sure our audience takes away from your work and your blog? I think that learning is an ongoing process. I hope that they're coming along for the ride of me screwing up like me stumbling my way through trying to deal with these very contentious, very controversial, very emotionally charged issues is I'm trying my best and I'm going to screw up. 
And that allows the students to go, okay, well, I'm going to try my best at whatever I want to do, but I'm going to probably screw up. But you're going to screw up forward, hopefully. I think that's probably my biggest aim, why I went to social media and why I started a podcast and stuff like that is just to share my process. I think learning is a process. My ego is not attached to having the best ideas. It's attached to finding the best ideas. And I think that allows me to be more free to be corrected and to learn and things like that. And hopefully that'll pass on to my students and then whoever is kind of following the stuff. Could you just quickly mention uh, your relationship to Heterodox Academy and the communities? The moral foundations, concepts and stuff like that really shaped a lot of this because then it's not like they're wrong and I'm right. Not to be a moral relativist, but like the idea of like, oh, they see things differently for real reasons, you know, biological reasons, and societal reasons and things like that. So it, that just connected with me early on. And then I wanted to be a part of an organization that was aligned with what I was doing because I was... It gives me some sort of legitimacy. I'm not just some crazy person, you know, talking to my phone. And there are people who are similar, who are doing a similar thing and on a similar path. And it opens up a lot of connections. I think that what it was, was I felt so alone. I was scouring the internet for other high school teachers or other teachers that saw what I was seeing with the lack of viewpoint diversity. And I just couldn't find them. So I felt very, very alone. So now our community, our K through 12 community has over 150 members. And the majority of them say the same thing. They echo the same thing I say, which is like, I felt very alone. I found this group and I see, wow, there's a lot of people that are thinking and seeing the same things that I am. And I think that that matters because you feel a little crazy when you're arguing against something that sounds so beautiful as anti-racism or something like that, or you're arguing, you're anti-social justice. You sound like a lunatic. So because of the way that the terms are framed and, and the implementation of a lot of these concepts. So to feel like you're not alone is really important. And then it gives like a a support network for teachers that are trying to inch and push back and engage in conversations to try and, uh, you know, do good pedagogy. And some of this stuff is not aligned with good pedagogy. Will Roosh on Heterodox Out Loud. Learn more about our Heterodox K-12 communities at heterodoxacademy.org. If you enjoy our podcast, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever you listen, and please leave us a review. Davies Content produces this show. I'm Zach Rausch. Thanks for listening.